So I'll stand in fellowship now as the choir comes down. It's good to see everybody back in the house of the Lord tonight. Ushers, come right on down if you would. Is there anybody we need to add to the prayer list tonight that we didn't mention this morning? Yes. Oh, goodness. Oh, yes. Definitely pray for Carson. Yes. Okay, let's definitely remember that. Good to see Miss Bullets here tonight. We've been praying for her after her surgery. Good to see you here. All right, if there's nobody else, but Eric, how about praying for the offering tonight?
preacher's going to come sing just before he preaches. Y'all pray for him as he comes. Let me say before I sing tonight that uh, as you have a chance uh, before or after services, I'd like you to read our letter that we got. Uh, matter of fact, Brother David brought it to me just today from one of our mission works, Return America. And um, in the letter this week or this month, uh, we've been informed that the, the legislature down in Raleigh uh, is debating the abortion issue. As you know, last year, the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade and basically remanded the abortion decisions or policies back to each individual state. Well, the legislature is debating that right now in this current session, and there are a few options on the table. Right, right now, North Carolina law uh, allows an abortion up to 20 weeks, and um, the senators and the Representatives in the House are debating on trying to get that lowered. Uh, some are wanting it to be uh, no, lo no more than 12 weeks. Another group are, is wanting it down to uh, when the heartbeat is first detected that you can't have an abortion after that. That's around six weeks. Of course, we as fundamental Christians would like to see that, uh, that no abortion at all is allowed because life begins at conception. But anyway, uh, the letter is indicating to us that because of the governor that we have, that no matter what they decide, when it hits his desk, he's going to veto it. And um, from what I understand from the letter right now in the North Carolina Senate, uh, we have uh, power to override the governor's veto, and we're only one vote shy of being able to override a veto in the state house. And so um, what they're talking about doing is when the debate is finished and the, uh, the bill goes before the full House and Senate and is passed, whatever version that is, and if it gets vetoed by the governor, there's going to be a rally in Raleigh, and they're wanting to get as many Christians as they can down there to rally uh, to try to get that thing vetoed. We'd love to see no abortions in North Carolina. Amen? And I believe that is murder. I believe it's cold-blooded murder. And um, so you be praying about that thing. Read the letter for yourself so you'll know exactly what it says and uh, be much in prayer for our legislature that they'll do the right thing and that they'll honor life no matter at what age. Amen. All right. Thank you for that. Okay, honey. pathway have you lived without love a life of tears have you searched for the great hidden meaning or is your life filled with long wasted years wasted years wasted years Oh, how foolish as you walk on in darkness and fear. Turn around, turn around, God is calling. He's calling you from a life of wasted years. Search for wisdom and see understanding there is someone who knows and always hears give it up give it up the load you're bearing you can't go on in a life of wasted years wasted years wasted years Oh, how foolish as you walk on in darkness and fear. Turn around, turn around, God is calling. He's calling you from a life of wasted years. Don't 
don't you know Jesus died for all sinners? He loves you and your guilt he gladly bears. Come to him, come to him, your sins confessing. You can go on with a life of fruitful years. Wasted years, wasted years, oh how foolish. As you walk on in darkness and fear, turn around, turn around, God is calling, He's calling you from a life of wasted years. Turn around, turn around, calling, He's calling you. From a life of wasted years. Amen. Thank you. Thank you I sure do appreciate that. First Corinthians in your Bibles tonight, chapter number 10. First Corinthians, chapter number 10. And when you find your place there in 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. I want to read a few verses this evening beginning with verse number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10 and verse number 1. I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters as some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now, all these things happened unto them for in sample. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Let's pray together. May we, our Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you and praise you for the scriptures tonight. Thank you for the services of this day, the opportunity to come back tonight to worship you once again. Our Father, for these next moments, I pray that your precious Holy Spirit will arrange the atmosphere for this message. Pray that you'd hold back all opposing forces of Satan that would seek to grieve and quench your spirit. Pray that the Spirit of God will have liberty to move about in every heart as is your will for us tonight. We ask that you would please speak to hearts. In Jesus' name, Amen. In the first 11 verses of 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, given by the Holy Spirit and written down with the pen of the Apostle Paul, we're given a specific uh, purpose that these scriptures were given unto us. The Bible tells us that they were for our admonishing and for our warning and for our teaching as we examine the lives of those Israelites as they journeyed 
through this wilderness. And we find that the jest of this passage of Scripture is that it tells us what the nation of Israel's behaviors were as they journeyed through that wilderness. And it was given to us as an example of how not to live, of what not to do in our Christian life. This is given directly to the church. This is a Pauline epistle. And we find our doctrines for the New Testament church in these Pauline epistles. And here we see that in verse number 6, the Bible reminds us, now these things were our, were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. May I say that as you walk with me down through the text of this scripture tonight, that we can see what the nation of Israel was up to and what God had called them out for. Look at these tonight. See if any of your sins are on this list. In verse number 7, he tells us first of all that they were guilty of idolatry. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them. Anything that you put above the Lord Jesus Christ in your life is an idol. It doesn't matter what it is. And they were guilty of being idolaters. Then they were also in verse number 7, they were guilty of just being pleasure seekers. Just wanting to fulfill all of the desires of the flesh. It says the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And that's what a lot of people do in life, is they just play. They, they play at everything. And worse of all, many just play church. They just have a form of religion but deny the power thereof. And the Bible tells us from such turn away. In verse number 8, they were guilty of immorality. And they were guilty of uh, sexual perversions and uh, sexual passions. It says, neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed. And fell in one day three and twenty thousand. The Bible tells us in verse number 9 that they were guilty of just plain old willful sinning. Now I want you to look how bad they had gotten in verse 9. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Now we know that that's particularly, talking particularly over in the book of Numbers, when the children of Israel started mum, mumbling and grumbling and murmuring and and complaining about the route that Moses was taking them on. And God sent them those fiery serpents. And you'll recall the only way they survived that was that the Lord instructed Moses to fashion a brazen serpent and put it upon a pole and hold it up for the people to see. And that was a type of Christ on the cross paying for the sins of man. And all that looked upon the serpent, the Bible says that they lived. That word tempt there, what does it mean when it says, neither let us tempt Christ? Well, that word tempt there carries with it a pretty strong definition. It means by irreligion and immorality to test the patience or the avenging power of Christ. It's godly people purposely living ungodly lives. And when we're doing that, we're testing the patience and the avenging power of Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but personally, I don't care to do that. I really don't care to do that. Well, that's what they were guilty of. And then, in verse 10, they were guilty of just discontented complaining. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Just discontented, complaining. 
murmuring, belly aching all the time. Never can find anything good in anything. The Lord casts a dim view upon those behaviors. But you know, these Israelites, as they were wandering through this wilderness, they, they weren't all bad all the time. I mean, you know, none of them over the age of 20 except for Joshua and Caleb, even survived the wilderness. They all died out there because they would not believe God uh, when the report of the spies came back and said the city's just like God said it was and, and uh, we can have it, it's ours for the taking. And the, the others said, no, there's walled cities and giants and it's just not worth it. But even in that rebellion and even in the wilderness journey, I believe if we look at these people who God took care of, He fed them every day without fail. They didn't even have to buy clothes or shoes. It's amazing. That's one of the miracles of the Bible is that for 40 years, them little young ones walking around and as they grew, their shoes grew with them. And as they grew, their clothes grew with them. That's a miracle of God. That's beyond explanation. But I believe these people as they were in the wilderness, they were looking for something to strengthen them, and to stabilize their lives. Have you ever stopped to think about how unstable and how their lives were just an upheaval? I mean, for 430 years, God's people was in slavery. And I don't know how many generations that is. I didn't do the math. But that's several generations of people who knew nothing of bondage and oppression and knew nothing but the end of the whip and the end of the rod of the Egyptians. And it was not very much of a life, but at least it was a stable life. They knew what was expected of them. They knew they were going to be fed. They knew they would have shelter. And though they were slaves to the Egyptians, their lives, and don't take this the wrong way, but their lives was somewhat stable. Not good, but stable. And then God comes in and sets them free and they march out of Egypt and they're leaving everything they ever knew and they're following Moses out into the wilderness and there's a lot of challenges and there's a lot of uh, new things that they're going to have to learn and they're looking for some stability and for, uh, uh, for something that, uh, to strengthen them in this life of upheaval, trying to get to this promised land and to live this new life that God has promised them. You know, not much has changed down through the years. People today are still looking for something to strengthen them and to give their life some stability. We live in very uncertain times. We're living in the age of downsizing and layoffs and there's no job safe anymore. Uh, no, nobody has a job that's secure. Uh, it could all be lost tomorrow. You know, like um, Brother Scott was teaching this morning in Sunday school how that uh, multi-millionaires lost everything they had overnight when the Great Depression hit. And everything they owned became worthless in less than 24 hours. Their life was in upheaval. And they found their solution in suicide. Never gave God a chance that things might turn around. And so today people are still trying to find that strength and stability in their life, but so many times they're finding it or trying to find it in the wrong things. Trying to find it in the things that energize and pleasure the flesh. Money and possessions and popularity and being in the right clique or being in the right circle of friends or you know knowing the right people the list goes on and on and on and all of those things have one thing in common they all fail in the end and all leave you hanging the Bible tells us exactly what we need for strength and stability in our life and it's not a what and the Bible tells us that his name is Jesus and he is our rock now my text tonight is found in verse number 4 of 1 Corinthians 10. 
And the Bible is speaking about them wandering through the wilderness. It says in verse 4, And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. And that's what I'm talking about for a few minutes tonight. Our rock is Christ. This fourth verse is based on an event that took place in Exodus chapter 17 in verse number 6 when the Bible says, Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Oreb. Thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it that the people might drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And great waters from great depths came out of that Flinty rock, that flinty stone, waters to revive the fallen, waters to refresh the famished and to restore the fainted. The Bible has much to say about Jesus being our rock. You see, we're founded upon a rock, and that rock is Christ. He is the foundation of our life if we're born again. The Bible tells us in Exodus 33, 21, that in the presence of God is the rock. The rock's not out here in the world around the worldly pleasures, but the rock is in the presence of God. You remember when Moses was going back up on Mount Sinai to receive the second set of tablets? The Bible tells us in Exodus 33, 21, And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand. What what did he stand upon, church? He stood upon a rock. The Bible tells us that there is no other rock but our Lord. For a second Samuel verse chapter 22 verse 32. For who is God save the Lord and who is a rock save our God? There is no other foundation but the Lord. The Lord is the rock upon which all our strength is founded. Psalms 18 in verse 2 reminds us the Lord is my rock and my fortress and, and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. And you know, Peter told us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, that to those of us who know Christ as our rock, He is precious to us. Is Christ precious unto you? Unto you therefore which believe He is precious, but unto them that would be disobedient the stone which the builders disallowed, the same as the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Tonight, for a few minutes, I want to share with you some things that Christ is in the life of the believer as our rock. First of all, I want you to know that as our rock, The Lord Jesus Christ brings stability into our life. Don't you long for stability? I don't like living or flying by the seat of my pants, as the old saying goes. I like some stability, amen? I don't take my stability for granted, but I sure do like it. You know, I I like, uh, like coming home to the same place every day, amen? I love uh, the time that my wife and I spend together. It's, uh, it's not as much as we would like, uh, but we praise God for what we have. And that's a stability that, that gets us through life. But the, the greatest stability that we have in our life as a Christian is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 13, 8, you know this verse, Jesus Christ the same. That's our stability. Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. People change like the wind. (laughs) Whichever way the winds are blowing, that's the way the crowd's going. People will change their personalities just to fit in with a certain crowd. That's no way to live. And God help us. Sometimes people will change their convictions in order to be popular. My friend, one of the hallmarks of a child of God is our convictions. Let me just say, if you don't have convictions, or if you compromise your convictions, you really don't have a whole lot of anything. I think I've told you this before, but the Supreme Court of the United States 
will honor your convictions. Did you know that? I've got an article back in the office written by an attorney on that very subject. Convictions versus preferences. People may say, well, I have convictions. But when it boils right down to it, it may just be a preference. The courts won't protect your preferences, but they'll protect your convictions. Well, what's the difference, preacher? What's the difference between a conviction and a preference? Well, I'll tell you how the Supreme Court defines it. A conviction is something that you're willing to lose employment over. That's a conviction. A conviction is something that you're willing to be incarcerated for. We're talking about our Bible convictions now. Are you willing to lose your job over them? Are you willing to be incarcerated for them? Let me say, we're not many years away from that if things continue on their path. I'm not a prophet. I, I, don't, I can't see into the future. But i got enough sense to open my eyes to the way things are now. And in a few years, if there's not a change, we may have to be incarcerated for our convictions. And thirdly, a conviction is something you're willing to lay down your life for. Are you willing to die for this Bible? Are you willing to die for this gospel? Are you willing to go to jail for this gospel? If the law came through the door tonight and pointed their finger in my face and said, you will stop preaching in the name of Jesus or we're going to carry you to jail, would you continue coming to worship and to praise God and keep on keeping on with your pastor sitting down in the jailhouse? Those are convictions. And those are things that stabilize our life. The old songwriter said, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. I didn't say and I don't preach that Christ and Him being our rock will bring safety, or not safety, but uh, bring a life free from trouble, but it will bring a life of stability. Number two, as our rock, the Lord Jesus Christ brings strength into our life. It's really wonderful being saved. We have a stable life in Jesus Christ. But as our rock, Christ also brings strength into our life. The psalmist said in Psalm 62 in verse number 7, In God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. When it comes to this, none of us have as much as we would like to have. And the older that we get, the more this starts going away. The older we get and the slower we go, the muscles start losing their vigor and their vibrance. And we get weaker and weaker and eventually we just give up the ghost and we die. But you know, in the men's prayer room, I was mentioning Dr. Seitler a while ago. Dr. Seitler believed that his last day on earth would be his best day. He said, I, I will be at my weakest physically. He said, but I believe with all my heart I'll be at the zenith of my strength spiritually on my last day as I prepare to cross over. We gain that spiritual strength through our own weakness by confessing that His grace is sufficient. Amen. His grace is sufficient. His grace is all that we need. And most gladly, therefore, we'll rather glory in our infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon us. Christ is our salvation and Christ is our glory and He's our strength and He is our hiding place. My friend, the, the things that we're longing for in life to bring us strength and stability 
are not found in the things of the world, but in the things of Christ. Thirdly, the Bible teaches us that as our rock, Christ brings that safety. I mentioned a minute ago, He brings safety into our life. The psalmist told us in Psalms 94 and verse 22, But the Lord is my defense, and my God is the rock of my refuge. The Lord is my defense. Isn't that great? You know, if you get in trouble, and you have to go before a judge in our court system, most likely you're going to take someone with you. And if you're the accused, you're going to be known as the defendant. And that person, whether it be a man or a woman, that's going to go with you will be called a defense attorney. And they are there to offer up your defense against those charges. Well, I want you to know tonight that every one of us in this auditorium tonight and everyone under the sound of my voice, we are a defendant in the great courtroom of life. And the devil is the prosecutor. And he's got something on every one of us in here tonight. None of us are innocent. But you know what? As a defendant in that court, and the devil is my accuser, I've got an offense attorney. And his name is Jesus. Because 1 John chapter 2 verse 1 reminds me, My little children, these things I write unto you, that you sin not. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. That word advocate's where we get our word attorney from. Jesus is our lawyer. He's my defense. And you know what? When I stand before the Lord, my judge, the only defense I have, I only have one defense. I don't have a plan B. And I'm not settling for no plea bargain. There's one thing that does the talking on my behalf and your behalf as a child of God, and that's the blood of Jesus Christ. (laughs) Just like Sammy was playing during the offertory tonight, the blood covered it all. Amen. I'm glad that Jesus is my defense and He brings safety into my life. Now lastly, I want to give you one more. As our rock... Christ is the foundation on which we stand. Where are you standing tonight? A good preacher friend of mine who's now in heaven, Brother Olin King, came over to New Birth one Sunday and brought some of the boys from the boys' home with him over there. And he preached a message that Sunday morning on this subject, Are you standing where you stood when you started? What a great message about staying where God puts you. Staying upon that rock. That rock was Christ. We don't need anything else. Christ is all we know. Christ is all we need. And the psalmist reminded us in Psalm 40, verses 1 and 2, I waited patiently for the Lord, and He inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. That little psalm there tells us that when we cried out, the Lord listened to us. He inclined His ear to my prayer. Not only did He listen to me, but He lifted me. He lifted me up out of the mire and the muck of sin and transgression, which where we all were living before we got saved. And He lifted us. And when He lifted us, then He landed us. And He landed us on a solid rock. And that rock was Christ, according to my text tonight. That rock was Christ. You see, He then laid the foundation for the rest of my life. It says, He established my goings. The psalm goes on to say that He put a song in our heart and praise on our lips for Him upon a rock. Paul warns us in this book of 1 Corinthians in chapter 3 and verse number 11. 
He says, For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. To take heed. That means to take notice. Be careful how you build your life upon that rock. First of all, make sure that your life is upon the rock. Make sure that you're on the right foundation. So many people today are trying to build their life on the wrong foundation. And it's all those things I mentioned a moment ago. The worldliness, the worldly pleasures. All of those things will fail and let you go. If you're founded upon Jesus Christ, you find the stability and the strength that you're longing for. Jesus said it like this. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 24, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken unto a wise man who built his house upon a rock. The rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. The rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. It came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings the people were astonished at his doctrine for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribe. Jesus said, here are two men and here are two houses. Men probably look pretty much alike. The houses, no doubt, were both beautiful. And I'm going to step out and say that no doubt both houses were built equally well and were equally beautiful. But you see, it's not the man And it's not the house. It's the foundation that tells the tale. Jesus said, if you'll believe this book, and if you'll trust me, He said, I will liken you unto a man that put his house on the rock. And nothing can destroy something that's on the rock. The rains descended, the winds blew, and beat upon that house. It stood. Not because it was a great house, but because it was on a great foundation. The other man, his house was built upon the sand. Sand is unstable. It's always shifting and moving. Jesus said when the rains descended and the winds blew and beat upon that house, that house fell because it was on the wrong foundation. Our our rock is Jesus Christ. I pray that you're on that right foundation. I pray that you're building on the right foundation. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you for the Word of God tonight. Thank you for being our rock, our stability, our strength, our safe place. It's not about us, Lord. It's not about who we are or what we do. The children of Israel had a hard time figuring that out. And like the song we sung tonight, they wasted many years, lived many wasted years trying to find strength and stability in the wrong things. And they died in the wilderness. I pray tonight for this congregation as we offer up, dear Lord, an invitation for one and all to come as Your will dictates to them, Father, that each one here tonight will find their stability and their strength, not in the foundation of the world that's shifting and moving, but on the rock of Christ. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name and for His sake. Amen. What's our number tonight, brother?